Does it sound? Okay, yeah, it sounds. Um, I'm really, really pleased to be here. Um, I was here last year, and I was like, this is a great conference. And then he invited me, and I was like, yes, there's no time, but yes, yes. <laughs> um, so I work at Mozilla. I, my job title is a thing, but what I actually do is I help people build cool stuff for the web. That's all I want, basically. So I want to start today with an assumption, and that's that you all are musicians or artists. I don't care if you are not, you are. Um, and you're also developers. But not only that, you're also very edgy, like incredibly edgy. You might be like hipster or whatever, but just think about this. Consider yourself an edgy musician developer. And you want to break frontiers. You want to go where no one has been before. You basically want to put your art on the web. Um, but you are developers, and as well, you know, that developers are very clever and smart, and they're like, oh, yeah, I know, we can just use the audio tab. And yes, you can use the other tag. You could use it, but I mean, you can just use this nice tag that's got this cool song, and you have controls and preload, and it will start rendering. Uh, it would start a network request. It will load the things for you. It will decode the stream, buffer, did all those things you don't want to bother with. Uh, render the controls so you can play and pause, and you know how you don't need to deal with accessibility because it's all built built in for you by the browser. Um, progress, indicator, time. It also has events, so you can see if it's loaded, if it's there an error, if it's ended, which is cool as well. Um, and you have some methods, which is load, play, and pause. So yeah, you can play music, but that's um, like you can't really say play this thing at this exact point in the future. You can just like please load whenever you're ready. And you cannot really trigger multiple instances of the same sound without doing hacks. You need to clone the node and set the source to the same thing, because it's actually a DOM element. And the issue with that thing being a DOM element is it's got some extra overhead. So each time you do the thing, um, each time you clone the thing, the, the DOM tree has to create a node, uh, set properties, do all those things that you don't really need because you just want to play audio. And you cannot really do visualizations because the output goes wow, directly to the speaker. So there's no way to hook and say, give me the FFT data. There's nothing. There's just audio for you. So, and then this is the worst. In some systems, I think it's iOS, you get a full screen player instead of whatever, even if the audio tag is invisible. So that's, it just doesn't work. It doesn't. You're, you're, you're not okay with this because you're edgy and you're cl clearly cool. So we kind of like pessimistic and like, is that all over? Do we just write native apps? Um, do you know what? Artists are poor, so you cannot afford writing an app for iOS and Android and BlackBerry, Windows Phone, Firefox OS, uh, Tyson, I don't know, whatever. Uh, you just don't. Um, so the things that we have with audio, and um, this is the unofficial um, logo that we got. And so with web audio, we can fix all those issues, and, and it's going to work everywhere, which is amazing. So we can be artists and have our art spread through the web and not worry about distribution or anything. So the good thing with WebAudio, well, there are many things. Uh, first thing is this modular. You can just get what parts of WebAudio you're interested in. You don't need to buy into the whole thing. And then it's also interoperable with other APIs. So that means that everything exists in the same space and the same data space, and you can move data back and forth between other APIs and like build great mashups, you know, like if it's 2005 again. And, and it's also not attached to the DOM. That means that it's running in a separate thread. So if you're doing like fancy things, uh, graphic things with HL or whatever, and that kind of gets stuck for a while and you lose frame rate, it's OK, because it's in a different thread. So it's not going to block and get glitchy. Our ears are super sensitive to glitches. And the minimum thing, like with frame rate slowing down, you can be OK. But glitches are something that you're like, whoa, 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 that's, that's breaking. We, 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 we don't accept that kind of thing. We are very action with audio. So, and finally, finally, uh, when Remy was saying in 2012, there wasn't web audio in all the browsers in 2012, so I wouldn't be able to build the JS code thing. Um, finally, this works in mobile and tablets and desktop. So finally, you can do this thing. So I wonder, like, if I was you, I would be like, yeah, how does it work? So the first thing we do is we create an audio context, and if you've, if you've done any JavaScript graphics programming, this is very similar to the Canvas context except you don't create the canvas context. You just create the audio context. And it's like this. Uh, you might need some polyfills. There are polyfills, because WebKit still has WebKit prefix in audio context. Um, but that's basically where everything happens. It's like a canvas context. Everything is running inside this little box. And you can actually have more than one audio context per page. But generally, you just have one. 
And so once you get the node context, you get methods to create audio nodes. And some nodes generate audio, some others alter it, and some others let you examine what's going on. And they all together form the audio graph. The audio graph? What? <laughs> Uh, so this is an example of audio graph. What I meant with nodes is that you have different nodes that generate different things, and then others uh, kind of alter. It's like um, you know, like those fancy things that musicians have in the floor in concerts. That's the kind of nodes we are talking about. And then finally, they are connected to the destination node, which is a representation of your speakers, essentially. So this is how you would make some noise. You create the other context. You create an oscillator using this method, which comes with the audio context. Then you connect the oscillator to the destination, and then you start the oscillator. And here's this demo, which is not really impressive, and I hope the volume is not too high so we don't kill anyone. Uh, um, but, but basically, uh, <laughs> I warned you. <laughs> um, I'm going to try again. I hope it's slower now. Um, I want to show you now the, the same thing, but uh, using uh, the web audio editor, which is the new DevTools thing in, in Firefox. And works, which is not always the case. I'll show you more in detail later. Um, so you saw that I just started this thing with all the context current time, and then you can also say, I mean, current time means now. And then you can say, I want this thing to happen in three seconds. So you can schedule all the things and just leave your thing running. So three seconds is plus three, which is pretty simple. And then you can stop it. You can schedule stops in, in the future. And then you might think, and now that I've stopped this thing, I'm just going to start it again. And you try this thing, the latest line, and it doesn't work. And I, I think I, I don't have fingers enough to count how many people have told me, why can't oscillators be restarted? It's just broken. And so my only answer so far has been, welcome to your first web audio gotcha. <laughs> because for performance reasons, the nodes are meant to be used only once. So once you use them and stop them, you are supposed to get rid of them somehow, and, and they will get rid of somehow, and, and you create new ones. Um, so automatically this pause, as long as you don't keep references. References is not just references in the strict JavaScript sense of um, you know, like memory and all those things they use for keeping references. It also has some connotations in the audio land, like, for example, a reverb node, which is a node that has some kind of like reverberation effect. It's alive even after you're not using it anymore because it's still processing the previous echo. So that kind of, I mean, there, there's a link here. I will publish the slides, but that's the thing that details what that it means for a node to be live. So if a node is live, it's not going to be disappear. It's going to be like remaining in your computer's memory forever and basically leaking memory. So the good thing of the web audio editor is that you can use that for, ah, that's not what I wanted to do. You can use it for tracking if you're leaking. Like this example is leaking. I wrote it intentionally so it would leak. It has two sources of errors. I will let you to find them. But I want to show you how this an exercise to find what's the leak. Uh, so the solution for this thing is to write your own wrapper. And it's kind of like moderately lazy. This is an implementation, like to keep an internal node, which is the actual oscillator you're using, and make a node for if you need to null it. Uh, so when you start, before you actually tell it to start, you make sure that it's live. When you stop it, you say, hey, I need this thing to be null next time you are in as this situation. And then this is how you ensure the node is live. There are better ways to do this thing. Um, each time I think of this, I think of a better way. So I guess this is still room for improvement. Um, and the way you would use it, once you have this thing, is you create an oscillator, you under the context, an oscillator, and then you could just do this stop, start, stop, start all the time, and it would just work all the time, like here. <laughs> Internally, it's being created, but I'm not caring about that thing. Uh, but wouldn't it be cool to see what's going on, right? So we can use an analyzer node, which lets you um, see what's going on. When, when you connect something to the analyzer node, you can see what 
the, the shape of whatever is connected to the analyzer node. So you create it just as you would create the oscillator. You take the context and say, hey, create an analyzer for me. And you don't need to care about the FFT size. And what well, it's important here is that you create an array to put the data from the analyzer node because you don't want to be creating leaks. So you just allocate the data so you can fill it with um, the output from the analyzer. It's time you request animation frame. As you can see, I'm just using APIs, yes, you're used to use. Um, we're not doing weird things here. We're just using a standard JavaScript. So we say we want to draw, so we call the analyzer, hey, let me know what's, what's going on right now. And it gives you this array with tons of data, and you can do whatever you want with that. In this case, I'm just drawing scope style, so we can see that's a nice sound wave. And I know you're wondering, can we change something different? <laughs> that maybe it's okay, but it's kind of started to be boring. So yeah. Um, the nodes have properties that we can change. So for example, you have the selector tape. And so the default is sign that you uh, think are acquainted by now. And then there's a square, the sawtooth, triangle, and this custom, which is weird as hell, and I still don't really understand. It involves imaginary functions and imaginary functions, yep. Um, so this is how you change it. You just say square, and it just changes. So here's this example with the previous thing. So that's pretty easy. And then, but we are still playing pretty much the same thing. We're just changing the shape. So you would say, okay, let's change the frequency so we get a different pitch. And so you say, okay, it's a property. So I'll just change the frequency. And it doesn't work because this is another gotcha. Um, and you're like, what is this? So you go to the, uh, to the API spec and it says oscillator frequency is an A param. And then you go like up and it says A param means audio param. And then, yes, what's with the audio param? What's the point of this? So you need to access it in a different way because it's a special. So you need to access it with dot value. Exactly what? What? What's the point of this? Um, so, I mean, the demo is obvious. It's just changing. Um, so what's the point? Why do we have this A param thing? And the point is superpowers. Um, the superpower number one is that you can schedule changes with very accurate timing. So we can kind of do, do very experimental RT stuff. Um, and I'll tell you first what not to do. Don't just set interval and don't just set timeout. Because the thing is, you might w suppose you want to go from 440 to 880, and you say, okay, I'll just set uh, an interval and I'll keep updating the frequency in every update. So you expect to get something like that. This is like going upwards, but because set interval is not really going to be running at every moment of the, of the thing being played, it's going to be running at some point. So what you might get is actually something like this. Um, so, so you can see that the, our ears are really, really sensible to small differences in pitch. So you need to be scheduling changes um, in a different way. And the different ways is using the audio param approach. Uh, you have um, this list of time events per parameter. So you can say, for example, I want this thing to be at 440 now and 880 in three seconds from now, and the engine will do the interpolation for you, and you don't need to be calling set timeout. Because remember, this is running in its own thread, so it's this different world of web audio. So there's this set of functions that let you add events to the list. So you can say, um, this is like defining curves in Photoshop, and then having the engine play the, the curves for you. So this would be just linear, exponential. I mean, this is pretty obvious. I'm not going to bore you. So this is how you would go from 440 to 880. You say, start with 440 with set value at time, 440 now, and then just go up to 880 in three seconds. Again, the same example that before. And that would just go up. So that's super smooth. It doesn't have weirdnesses or glitches. Um, there are a couple of mini gotchas, of course. Um, the first one is you should actually avoid using parent of value because once you use this thing, it doesn't add an event to the list. And what happens is that later you can say, I want to linear ramp to a lower value, and it doesn't happen. It changes the thing immediately because there are no events. So just don't do this. Don't do, use that thing. I, I'm just using set uh, value at time, like directly. So I'm always sh safe that the thing is going to work. And then also avoid using zero as when, because the events are 
order by time, if two of them have zero, it doesn't really order. It kind of like over, <laughs> overrides the latest, so it doesn't uh, interpolate or do anything. So weird things happen, so just don't do that. Um, and with this knowledge, we can build this ADSR envelope, which looks like this. And you're like, what? <laughs> the thing with music is that you get kind of like carried away with acronyms and mysterious things, and no one knows what you're speaking about, so you look like more important and more artistic. Um, so that means attack decay sustain and release. And let's go back. So that's the attack is when the node, when the key gets pressed, so it's like vroom, and then it goes down slightly because you don't really have that energy. And then it keeps in the uh, sustain level. And then you release the key, which is when you know, like release the key. And then it goes down to zero. So we know how to make values change now, and we can schedule them so we can build this thing in a very easy way. Um, I just want to say that I wrote this thing with pure JavaScript and set interval, and it, I think I spent a week <laughs> writing this thing. So you can do this thing with, um, sorry, those are examples. Blah. Let me go back and track. So ADSR are in many places in synthesizers, like here and here and here and here and here and here. As you can see, they are very popular. So once you knew how to use this thing, you're like able to understand kind of half of software synthesis. Um, but we don't know how to control the volume yet. We know how to generate noise, and we know how to analyze the sound, but we don't know how to change the volume. But there's a gain node, which basically will multiply whatever input it's got with the new value it's got. So we create the oscillator, we create the gain node, which is the new thing here. We connect the oscillator to the gain node, and we connect the gain to the destination, instead of connecting the oscillator directly to the destination. So the um, the gain node is in between. And so basically I'm saying start from zero, ramp up to one in the attack length, then go down to sustain in the decay length plus attack length, because this is all scheduled in the feature. And then release is basically go down to zero from the point where you release the key. So that's pretty simple. And I've got this example where wherever, wherever I press space, I'm going to play the same node that before, but I'm applying this envelope to the gain node. And so it's going to sound differently. It's different. So it's not that harsh. You can simulate piano notes with this. Um, and so you can also cancel events, obviously. You don't want to be in the situation where you send all the parameters for generating your song or whatever, and then the user wants to go to a different page, and you don't want the thing to keep playing. You want to pause the thing. So you cancel all the events, and when he's back, to resend all the events. So you just can cancel the events from current time for in the future and just cleanse all the thing in the list of events. And here's a superpower number two, which is the one I like most. It's modulation. And that means that you connect the output of one node to the input or the audio param of another node. And you might have seen this in synthesizer panels, and you might be like, what is this thing even like? shapes and LFOs and modulation. What is this thing? It's just like so bizarre and weird. Um, so what LFO means is low frequency oscillators. And they are low frequency because we can actually listen to those things. Like, can you listen to this? This sound? You cannot listen to this. That's because it's, um, I'm undulating too slowly for you to listen to this. I think the, I should be doing this thing 100 times per second so you could listen to anything. Um, so we can hear those things, but we can use them to alter all the things that we can actually listen to, things that are in our hearing range. So f that means that we can do spooky sounds. Isn't it great? Um, and I'm so sad that we are not doing this thing in Halloween because this is so cool. <laughs> um, so I need you to watch out because this is complex. Um, so we create a novel context, an oscillator, and a new oscillator, the, which is the low frequency oscillator. Then we create a gain node, and we connect the low frequency oscillator to the gain node. So oscillators run from minus one to one. And I said that the gain node multiplies whatever the oscillator is being sent, sent into the gain node by whatever the gain value is. So if gain is 100, I'm going to end up with something in minus 100, 100, okay? Are we all okay? Cool. Um, so we connect the output of this minus 100, 100 gain to the frequency of the normal oscillator we were using so far, not to the destination. And keep watching out. This is, this is over soon, so don't worry. Um, this is the frequency value for 40 as right now. And then I'm going to connect 
I'm, I'm going to make sure that the low frequency oscillator is really slowly oscillating, like one hertz, which is once per second. Um, I did science, so that's why this is natural to me. Um, and then we start the both things. And what is going to happen is that the frequency is going to go from uh, 340 to 540 in one second because it's been like kind of like it's like if you have a string and someone is like pulling and it's like changing the values. So it's the same feeling. And so I made this spooky LFO thing uh, where I'm going to make things spooky. And it's going to sound like 50s movies, which I think are great. We have spookiness <laughs> enough. <laughs> and I mean, I'm weird like that, and I like 50s movies, but I know that people like kind of play more normal stuff. So you can also play six and samples. And there are two solutions for this. You have the audio buffer source node for short samples. And I say short because it keeps all the decoded data in memory. I think it's one meg per minute. So you need to watch out with um, how many samples you load. And then there's also the longer MIDI element audio source node for longer sounds. You just remember that it's longer, so it's for longer sounds. And that one actually decodes the, thing, the things like as it needs. So it's a streaming, and it doesn't load the whole thing in memory. So this is just JavaScript. So we are just using an HTML, HTML HTTP request. But we are saying we want to know write buffer, which means just give me the binary data. And then we get that binary data and send it to the context and say, hey, decode this thing for me. So it will just basically load whatever the browser can decode, like MP3s, OGGs, uh, Waves, WebM. And I'm not sure if you can put music there. Um, and then it would just call the loaded callback if everything goes OK. So uh, you create the buffer source. And that buffer source actually needs a buffer to play with. So once the thing is loaded, you say, OK, the buffer for my buffer source is going to be this buffer source I just got from the HTML HTTP request. And then you say, start. Because the buffer source works just like oscillators. You can say, start when, or stop when, and blah, 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 blah. Um, so start and stop. And they even die like oscillators. They are so similar that they have the same shortcomings. But you can just reuse the buffer. You don't need to load the thing again and do the, the, uh, the request again. You just can reuse them. And you can even reuse the same buffer between several nodes. So you can kind of like, again, build RT stuff. We kind of like repeating samples and weird things, which are great. Um, so with this, I build the pew pew matic which is like drawing lasers and things. Um, and the thing is that every time I press sp space, it's going to trigger the sample, but because it's using this kind of very efficient web audio, it's not going to stall or anything. So I'm going to be pew pew firing things. Super, no, that quickly. Go back, go back, go back, go back. You didn't see this. OK. <laughs> That's the thing where you have iframes inside. Um, OK, whatever. So. Um, I just got carried away. But see, that's because uh, I knew that I wasn't going to fail. Um, but yeah, um, this is pretty easy to build, actually. And so you've got games. You can have many ballets being like playing at the same time. So you don't need to worry about performance and things, because if you do things right, it will be cool. Um, and now I told you that we have the MIDI element of the source node for longer sounds. And what it does, it, it's, like it's going to take audio or video, and the output of those that before used to just go directly to the speakers, now they are, into the, they are going to be in, brought into the audiograph. And then that means that we can do things with them. So we can uh, change the volume, filter them, manipulate them, do fancy things with them. So to just take a reference to a video or audio element and pass it as the argument to create media element or the source node. Uh, and then you connect it to the destination. This is equivalent to just connecting the video to the, to the like, I mean, it doesn't change the behavior by normal. So I took the Neon Cut video, and I'm going to modulate the volume of this using this, and I'm going to change the amount of volume I'm changing with this slider. We can be oh, good. Um, and there are more web audio notes. There are things like delay, filter, 
uh, panning, reverbs. I mean, the good thing of panning is I can, you can use this thing with things like 3JS. I've done this thing where you build this kind of world and you place things that emit sound and as you're navigating and you keep updating the position of the listener, you can have 3D audio pretty easily, um, but just, it's very simple. Um, and then you can have reverb, splitter, wave shaper, um, compressor, and those things are all very easy to use. They're all JavaScript nodes. They all work the same. So once you understand all your params and the kind of things, this is super easy to use. And this is the interface. You don't need to be able to read this, which I don't think you can. But that's more or less how it looks like. You have all these create methods that you can use to get fancy stuff out from an audio, audio context. But there is more. <laughs> Because, as I said, this is just using, you can do mashups. You can just connect things together, which is the great thing of the web, that you can connect all the things together. And as we get new APIs, we can do more cool stuff, which is what I work off. Um, so you can mix all the APIs. You can get user media and take the stream that you get from get user media and get it through filters and kind of like create echoes and um, kind of like boom boxes and that kind of cool, funny things. Um, you could also use this new thing called Web Audio Workers, where you can create your own nodes, and they are running in the same graph that you're um, uh, having. And that means that you can maybe port C code for, like, um, how is this thing called? For DSP code. You can port DSP code right in, written in C using mscripting or something like that, and then tuck it into one of those Web Audio Workers, and you're going to have like things that are just to be native running in the browser with the rest of the other Web Audio stuff. Uh, you also have something called offline audio context, where you can render as fast as possible, and you don't need to wait for the thing to be real time. Um, so I don't know, you're edgy, so you should be crazy here and like do more things that I can't even imagine. Um, but there's still more. And so I've been hacking away all this stuff for the last three years, and essentially I've done the same things over and over and once and once and once again but in different ways. So I've seen things that I thought were right, like my JSCon thing, I thought it was right. I was revisiting lately and I was like, Jesus Christ, <laughs> how could this even work? There are so many bugs, things that I didn't understand properly. Uh, I was doing set timeouts at interval, things that I shouldn't be doing. Um, so I've also spoken to many people about all this stuff. And this is, this is when it gets super interesting. Um, I, I, I did this uh, presentation past year in Vancouver about audio tags where I was mixing web components with uh, web audio. Um, and so Angelina saw this thing and said, oh, this is so, co so cool and so promising. We should do more of this. Um, so they created this GitHub org uh, for all this stuff. And I was like, yeah, yeah, you added me to this thing, but I don't know, but how do I, I don't know. So it just took there for like a year or something. Um, in the meantime, I spoke to Jordan Santel, who also works at Mozilla, and he wrote this thing called Dancer.js that lets you like, get bit detection and things that will work with Flash and more things. Um, so he also had built this thing called Component Audio or Audio Component or something that was based on Component, which is kind of like a package manager, one of those. Um, so he was like, yeah, it was, it was cool, but it wasn't really cool because you needed another, yet another package manager. <laughs> so we liked the idea, and I really liked some of the components that some people had built in the community. Like, he had pretty nice filters with, like, that, you know, like, simulating cabinets, like rock and roll cabinets that give you a warm sound to your instruments. And I was like, this is really cool, but I cannot use this thing because I have to buy into your whole component based thing and I need to kind of change my codes. I work from with you and I kind of just connect it as it was a normal audio element. And then I was also speaking to Max Ogden, who doesn't know Max Ogden. <laughs> um, uh, he's, he's great and I just, I'm so happy I kind of hang with him a couple of times this year. And every time I speak to him, I get inspired to build more things. Um, so he's, he and Substack, he's got this philosophy of little modules that do one thing and do that thing well. And I like when Max is, oh, today I brought two modules. And I was like, oh, how can you do this thing? Because my modules were too complex. But after speaking with him, I finally got the point. It's small modules. It's not just huge things. So that's why he can build two in a day. Um, so then the stars aligned. And this is even getting more interesting. Because I finally understood all the params. Like, it just took me two years. Uh, because I w probably wasn't reading the right things. And I also found a way to simulate custom audio nodes, which actually 
one of the writers of this pact told me, discouraged me actively, told me not to do so, but I'm so stubborn, I'm still doing that thing. So I'm doing this thing that shouldn't be done. And Remy invited me to speak about music in the 21st century. <laughs> so everything made sense finally after three years. So it was the last, the moment for open music. Um, which is that organization we, we created and now finally has a sense because I've basically been um, tearing apart all the code I've been working on from the last three years. And they are all, all in this repo, well not all of them, but most of them. Um, so you have web components, you have all the components, uh, things for eventing, so you can have a player and that fires notes for you and ten, like knows the timing of things. Uh, there are also functions for generating more noise, just in case you're not happy with the oscillators. Um, they are all based on NPM, and we use Verosalify. Everything is sorted out with NPM installed. You don't need to buy into other package managers. And that's funny. It's funny because things are so modular right now that even some of those modules are built on the previous models, like the brown and the pink noise depend on the white noise functions. So I'm kind of like having very little pieces that I'm using for building my whole thing. And you might be wondering, well, how does it look like? Sell it to me, Sole. Um, so it's you require the open music oscillator, you create another context, and then you create an oscillator using the other context. It's essentially the same thing where we have been doing until now. So you connect this new oscillator to a destination, and then you start it. So there's nothing new. It's just like the rest of all the nodes. So you can take one of my nodes and just use it with your code, and you don't need to change your code or anything. You just take this new piece of audio code and use it. So the principles is they should behave like standard audio nodes. Uh, the thing that Jordan had made had dot input and dot output properties. So you couldn't just say dot connect with this thing. You had to use a different syntax for those modules. So that meant that it wasn't easy to intermingle together. Um, there's also this other principle, which is one, one, one functionality, one module. My JSCon thing was this huge thing where you have the UI with the instruments and the sequencing and everything, and you couldn't just say, I like this instrument, I'm just going to use it. You had to clone the whole thing and just kind of like reference. It was, it was ugly and, and big and messy. Um, and, and it's also composable, which means, as I said, that you can use my modules to build bigger modules, or you can just use a small one. Like, maybe you just want the white function, just use that thing. Um, so. Our wish is to use that thing, or you look at them and you build yours, and I use them. Uh, and then by the virtue of composability, they become tools, and a web audio ecosystem forms, and we can make lots of music. Um, I sincerely hope for this, because I'm kind of bored of writing the same thing over and over. Um, so questions? We have seven minutes for questions. Thank you. <laughs>